Hello, everybody. Happy Sunday. Today is a new episode of Steinway Sundays with Susan. It's only Susan today. That's me. Um, usually it's Steinway Sundays with Susan and Svetlana. But today I have a special guest. And the guest is um, the Grammy nominated composer, Ilya Levinson. And um, Ilya and I go back quite some years. Um, I have met him in here in Chicago um, through a mutual friend and colleague, David Yonan, the distinguished violinist. And um, I began performing his music. Um, the first mm -hmm. piece I ever performed of Ilya's was his shtetl scenes uh, with the Chicago Symphony Orchestra's chamber music um, series at the Art Institute. So that was my first experience playing the music of Ilya Levinson, and it's just continued since then. And today, um, right now, I'd just like to introduce to you Ilya Levinson. Hi, Ilya. Hello, hello. Um, so good to see you here, and I'm really excited about what we're going to discuss today. I was just telling our listeners and viewers that um, you and I go back some years and were introduced by David Yonin, and the first piece I ever performed of yours was your shtetl scenes. Shtetl scenes yeah. And I'd like you to just tell us a little bit more about your background. You know, I mentioned that you're Grammy nominated. Tell us, um, the audience and viewers, what you were nominated for. Well, um, I'm music director, uh, pianist, and arranger of a new Budapest or film society. It's a group of Jewish cabaret. We are artists in residence at the University of Chicago Division of Humanities. And uh, our artistic director is Philip Bollman, who is a world famous scholar of uh, Jewish diaspora. And we perform songs written by Jewish composers and Jewish, uh, on the lyrics of Jewish poets, and those are cabaret songs, and cabaret makes the world upside down. So we perform songs of a German cabaret of 1920s, mm -hmm. uh, 1930s, like Kurt Tucholsky and Hans Eisler, um, and uh, Friedrich Hollander, and Hermann Leopoldi. And we recorded this CD, a uh, Jewish song of a stage and film, as Dream Falls Apart, in, uh, and we were nominated for this CD in 2016. Grammy nominated. It was, it was a wonderful, wonderful CD, yeah. and I voted for it. Yeah. Um, it should have won. It should have won the Grammy. No. But you know what? You were in such excellent company, and yeah. these days, yeah. just to even get a Grammy nomination, it just yeah. puts you way it's, up there it's in the terrific. atmosphere. It's terrific. Yeah. Um, but um, now going back just a little bit um, about our relationship uh, in, in collaboration, it started out with the shtetl scenes, which was right. a solo piano piece, which I asked you to um, to score for a chamber music ensemble so I could right. perform it with the CSO. And right. such a huge hit. Right. The thunderous applause for that piece, which was premiered in its chamber version um, for the CSO's chamber music series, it just will ever, it's just ever indelible, indelibly printed in my brain and my ears, you know, and um, it's been a repeated pleasure to, to perform that piece uh, so many times. Um, and you have subsequently revised it and, and also created other versions, um, yeah. including not just the trio version. No, you had done it originally as a quartet, but then you did it as a trio. Yeah. And then, um, and the original quartet was with a double bass and French horn, yeah. and violin and piano. Um, well, I love that scoring. And yet I've also, um, put it on my recent American Melting Pot CD in the trio format, yes. in the piano trio format. So um, in any event, uh, so, since then, um, I also had the great pleasure of um, recording your elegy for violin and piano with David Yonan. Right. And that's featured on our Four Century CD. And uh, to me, that's one of like the best recordings on the CD. I wish more people would know about it. So that's why I wanted to spread the word. You can hear this um, amazing piece. And the reason I bring up the elegy 
is that there's certain techniques and there's certain, because elegy is, you know, basically um, paying homage to, homage to somebody and who's passed. And, um, and now we're going to talk about your new piano trio, which has yeah. also a tie to the netherworld, the afterworld and the spirit and everything. And you know what, there's something unifying in all of your works, Ilya, which is, the spirituality of it. And I just, I, I'm, I'm, I'm always just totally enthralled and um, just, it, I think it's, your music is, is just so moving and spiritual and it, it just really says something. So um, that brings us right now, what else have I played of yours? I know I've played some other pieces. Uh, the ghost tango, actually. Oh, that's right. I think there's a ghost theme uh, actually kind of going through. I did not realize. I about that. We should have been programming this on the ghost themed program. Which, right. um, so the whole reason we're having this discussion now is to get some people excited. And I'm actually multi-streaming this to several Facebook accounts and to my YouTube. Um, next Sunday is going to be uh, the last performance of my Music with a View concert series at Sheridan Music Studio in downtown Chicago. And we will be having an in-person audience, so you can purchase tickets on in.live to be, if you pay the little higher price, you get to come in person. If you wanna just see it virtually, you can get on and watch the virtual live concert. This is not gonna be pre-recorded. It's gonna be live as it's happening. Um, live streamed on in.live and this will be next sunday at 2 p.m and the performance will be a ghost theme which will feature the dybbuk piano trio so we're going to get to talk about the dybbuk in a minute but i'll just mention in passing the other work on the program is beethoven's opus 70 number two the ghost trio and yours truly will also insert a little piece by William Bulcom called The Ghost Rag. So um, this is a really, really exciting and, and very, very moving program. And, um, and now I'd just like to turn our attention to your trio. And I'd love for us to first let people know what this trio is based on. Would you like to tell everybody? Sure, first to mention that it's a piece that I dedicated to you, Susan, and it's the first piece, original piece of music. I'm so happy that I finally had time and to write a piece um, for you. I'm so honored. I mean, I'm, I'm really touched. I, you know, wait a minute. I, we could, we're also forgetting you wrote Fireball for my piano oh, right, ensemble. Piano. That was an original work. Right. And, la and about two years ago, you did a Hanukkah medley for me and Steve. Right. Um, yeah. to perform, which was went over so beautifully. Um, yeah. So let's talk now about this Dybbuk trio, which you've dedicated to me. I'm, I'm just, you know, just tickle pink and so honored and having such a great time learning it, studying it and rehearsing it with uh, Alex Kaufman, a uh, violinist and um, your own wife, Martine Benman, the cellist. So let's go back now to what, when you first got the first inspiration and when you started thinking about it and working on it and how it's evolved. Yes, so um, the play, the book, or Between Two Worlds is written by uh, Solomon Ansky, or his um, um, original name, Sol Solomon Zanvil Rapoport. In 1863, he was born in Russia, in Vitebsk and died in 1920 in Warsaw, Poland. And so he was also a um, collector of uh, folk stories. And so uh, the book is a, a spirit that possesses a body of a living person. So just to tell you the plot of this. Uh, so th this uh, play is uh, well known and basically Ansky is known for, for this play and it's translated in many languages and the story is about young woman leia who on her uh, day of wedding is possessed by dibok and this spirit pro proves uh, is not is is a, a poor yeshiva student chonen who actually uh was uh, um, it's, it's kind of complicated so leia's father sender a rich merchant 
had a friend when they were young people and they get separated by they made a pact that when one of them if one of them will have son and another one will have daughter the, the children get married so uh, they the, made a shit off before their kids were even born yes yes they, they made this uh, agreement so and this agreement was broken and it turns out that this uh, um, poor yeshiva student chonin was a son of um friend uh, also who died friend of leah's father and as it turns in heaven the promises need to be kept and the spirit of the book goes into leah's body and though the ascender leah's father asks the rabbi israel to exhort the spirit leah dies and she and Chonan unites. Yes. Yeah, so I think also in the story, as I read the synopsis, um, it was that Chonan died first upon yeah. hearing yeah. Yeah. that Leah's father uh, basically promised her hand in marriage to someone yeah, else. To someone so he else. died. I guess he was just yeah. totally distraught and yeah. he was in love with her. Mm -hmm. and, and later we find out at the end of the movie that Leah was in love with him. Yes. yes. Upon her wedding day and yeah. evening, she's lying there thinking of him, and basically she dies too. Yes. From yes. heartache. Yes. And then, so they are eventually reunited. Reunited, yeah. So, yeah. While, uh, interestingly, also um, was that Conan's father wanted to sue Leah's father for breaking the promise and the contract they had together, but the rabbis stipulated you cannot promise something that doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. So they made this pact, this shidduch, before their children were even born. Right. And so technically he didn't, but they made the uh, Leah's father say Kaddish for the departed, the 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 the, the, the um, Conan, and they made him say that, and and interest. So he did have to, you know, atone for for, for being, you know, not entirely honorable, um, or at least you know. But what what I found was interesting in reading the full synopsis was that they tried repeatedly to do the exorcism, to get the Dybbuk, the, the yeah. soul of Kanan out of Leah's body. They tried repeatedly and he refused. He, yeah, the, the soul would not leave. So she was just basically possessed and they had to go to some special, um, you know, kind of witch doctor that could, there's a lot of mysticism, right. this right. whole concept of exorcism and spirits. I didn't really know that this existed in Jewish folklore. You oh, know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. In, the Hasidic, <laughs> in the Hasidic folklore. Now, the, the play that I actually wrote music, and it was twice, and uh, is, is adaptation by Tony Kushner. Okay. Uh, so first, I uh, it was in 2004 when David Vinitsky, uh, who was a director of Jewish theater project, he was a student at uh northwestern and this was his diploma work and he uh, i connected with him i think through matthew street klesmer band through Lori lipitz with uh, I, I had a great um, um work relationship with this band and i wrote this music for the play in 2004 and to my um great in, uh, excitement uh, jeremy aluma who is now uh, uh, director of Alliance for Jewish Theater, uh, did also debut as his diploma work in DePaul in 2018. And Jeremy wanted lots of music, so I extended on what I had and I wrote dances and um, just um, music for, for the uh, play. And uh, But actually, I like the music very much that I wrote in 2004, and I was thinking I should write a piece of chamber music. And, but, you know, I was so busy with teaching and with other uh, commitments. So finally, um, you know, maybe this year of solitude and isolation uh, allowed me to collect my thoughts. And I was, I, I, I wrote, I, yes, and I wrote this uh, piece uh, 
So um, this uh, trio does not really follow exactly the plot line. Of I the see. Project. Okay. That's important to know. Yes. Uh, and I think it's also important to note that um, uh, a number of other composers had considered writing or did actually write music for this play. Um, if one, I think, was Bernstein, uh, Copeland. Bernstein wrote a ballet version. Cop Aaron Copeland did. I had no idea. I didn't even know anything about this. But if we trace the roots to like who, like the, the Beethoven, the Ghost Trio, uh, was named Ghost. So I imagine that there's been a lot historically, a lot of music that has reference to spirits. And, <laughs> yeah, uh, and like uh, uh, back last, religious last, times, you know. Last piece of uh, Robert Schumann. Uh, mm -hmm. Ghost variations, and actually, yesterday I saw a production of Thompson Street Opera Company called Ghost Variations <laughs> uh, about the last days of Robert Schumann, and um, so the ghost theme is really in the air. It's in the air, and not only that, um, well, there there is there has been written an opera even by the same name to Dybbuk. Oh yes, my, yes. one of my teachers. Yes. Oh wow! So. So yeah. actually you join a cohort of extraordinarily distinguished famous composers with this new addition to a, a Dybbuk themed uh, trio. And um, in learning both your trio and um, the Beethoven Ghost Trio, which I've already knew and I've played many times, um, but in comparing them, actually there's, there's certain similarities um, you know, compositional techniques and effects that are common to both works, although they're worlds apart. Yeah, to my, yes, surprisingly <laughs> enough, you know, I listened, uh, actually this morning I listened to the Ghost Trio second movement, no, yesterday first time and second time this morning, and I, and wow, the the same timbral, the uh, Feature well, the violin and cello are playing in octaves, uh, separated, mm -hmm. creating this very eerie, eerie sound. So yeah, it's and and not only that, but the use of the bass of the piano with this rumbling that creates this tension right. and scary kind of uh, atmosphere. And um, and in watching the film, it, it, that very old film from 1937, which um, we can play a couple of excerpts for it for our viewers, um, that itself has a certain kind of scary, ominous tone. But I don't know if it's because it's all like black and white or because if it's the mu music or certainly like the, the sound, you know, the old sound. It's kind of a cross between a silent film and a and a I mean, there's there's some music, there's some spoken word, there's also subtitles. I don't know at what point this was in the history of movie. 1937. Yeah, but um, it, it seems, you know, by today's standards, um, like a very old movie. Very old movie. <laughs> and, and when you watch it, you just feel like, wow, this is like ancient. I mean, yeah. it's not quite yet 100 years old, but it just as well may be. But, but, but the story, I mean, the story, the story is, is temporary because unrequited love, one person dies. and I It's mean, a love story. Yes, it's, 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 a love, it's a love story. And, and this is what I emphasize. I mean, this is what I'm tracing in my trio, the uh -huh. love story between John and, and Leia. Yes. And, you know, it, Every, I think every major opera involves both love and death, and so Absolutely. many works, famous Absolutely. books, love Absolutely. and death. Whether it's Wagner or Liszt, or you know, these are the two most common themes of music that that has some kind of programmatic of, of, of human life. Those of human things. life, exactly. <laughs> and you know what's particularly fitting about playing this now is that. We are coming upon or approaching, hopefully, God willing, the end of a worldwide pandemic, yeah. during which time millions of people have died prematurely um, at, from a horrific uh, disease. And so I feel like, you know, we're all, we've all gone through a tremendous amount of suffering collectively, individually from this past year. And a piece like this really can help, I think, help, can help us heal because it 
it demonstrates um, and, and illuminates the importance of love and that um, that is what can triumph. Even in the face of death, the yeah. notion that there is an afterlife, the notion that we can be united and that um, love will essentially conquer all, um, yeah. okay. even, even in uh, the afterlife, in death, um, this is a story of that, of, of love um, continuing and even um, under such, you know, dire circumstances, um, you know, one has a, a sense of, um, you know, loss for both of the protagonists, but also a sense of relief that their love can continue and they can be together again. So the, the, um, exactly, this is what I was uh, thinking about in the last movement, the catharsis, and looking back and um, fi finding finding solace in the uh, this fact that Chonan and Leia are together. Yeah, would you like me to pull up right now the score and we can kind of sure. talk sure, about, we can talk about what Yeah, let me do that. Um, I just have to find it, um, window, here we go, um, and this should show up. Yeah, that's okay. good. Does that look good? Okay, yeah. um, so at the opening here, um, your instructions uh, indicate to keep, for the pianist to keep the pedal down from the yeah. very beginning. And I remember when I questioned you that, about this right. in, the, in right. the first, um, right. all the way to here. To, I have to measure the end of the 12th, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I questioned you about it because, oh, I definitely like wanted it to be like more clean sounding. I was like thinking like, you know, I, and I didn't know what your intent was in this one simple pedal marking. And this is, I think highlights the importance of, and the greatness, this the really special relationship that a performer has with a composer, um, the ability to like work together on a piece and to get know exactly what it is you want. You know, with Beethoven, we still ha we only have a two dimensional one, you know, a right. piece of paper, a score, and we don't even know what, what what's the sound that he really wanted. It all has to be interpreted in, through our own lens. But when I work with you, Ilya, um, I get to share with you my ideas, and you get to tell me directly what you have in mind. So that I feel that you know this makes it possible to get the your intentions as the composer you know, to, to really represent them in the best possible way. Um, so, so here in the opening, it's very, um, mysterioso. I love your, your, um, your, your tempo indications are more like characteristic character indications. Right. And, um, the pedal is kept down through all of this. Right. Um, and the use of your harmonics, uh, on this, in the strings, I think makes for a very, um, sort of eerie and um, murky kind of feel. It's it yes, is, yes. It, it opens a play opens with the Chonan in the temple in in the synagogue praying, and it's an old synagogue. And this is what I wanted to uh, portray: the space between the floor and the ceiling, the height, and and it's all the notes, you know, and you have. The very high notes and you yeah have so there's, there's a couple of um, there's almost no light I mean, yeah yeah and and this is what all this the atmosphere of half darkness half light uh, mm -hmm. the mystery mystery and uh, uh, Cholan is praying and he thinks about Leia how he can get her but he realizes that he cannot because uh, her father Sander will never allow a poor yeshiva student marry his uh, daughter. Oh, that's a sad thing, right there, yeah. in mm -hmm. of itself. You know, mm -hmm. I don't think parents should ever interfere in their children's, um, you know, in their love lives, social lives. True, I think true. Everybody has to, you know, be true to themselves to to a certain extent, although I think there isn't a parent alive who doesn't weigh in on their children's 
activities yeah, well. of yeah. May. I don't think any parent can um, sit back and and do nothing if they feel like their uh, their you know beloved child is you know picked the wrong mate. But um, that being said, um, there there is something to be said for uh, letting true love um, live. And so here now we approach after we have this very murky and very heavily pedaled, I guess it, it also brings to mind the acoustical properties of a large space. Uh, like yes, that, absolutely. That, that was my intention. And, and yeah. yes, so you, when you hear a bell or an organ or any kind of instruments in a large I mean, space. It, it, it's just a light. I mean, just speck of light that is going somewhere up and get lost. Now, what happens here in the Anamondo? It starts with a little duet. Of well, the those, those are Lei and Chonan. Those are two souls that are interacting, or it's in Chonan's mind, Leia comes. He envisions her. Mm -hmm. uh, and the entire first movement, first part, I mean, the, all the, the four movements are all attacker without interruption. Yes. Uh, so each of them comments on a particular um, element of the play in the first one, I mean, Chonan dies at the end of the first act. So the first one is the most emotional uh, movement where there is a great contrast between dynamics, soft and loud. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's really beautiful, beautiful um, part writing, the, the duet between the violin and cello here. And then it increases in fervor and the piano comes in for it right. to hear. And um, what what do you think that the piano represents in this? Oh, the, the piano, it, it's actually a uh, Chonin theme, mm -hmm. this uh, triplet. Um, you, you could hear my MIDI MIDI piano. So yes. that's that's a main theme of the spirit or the theme of desire. Uh huh. And so it goes goes to the climax, and after it is cut by this uh, Hasidic melody. This is where Chonan learns about that Leia is promised to another man. Oh, okay. Where is that in the? I mean, at B. At B. At, at B. Dum, bum, bum. Yeah. Ba, da, 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 da. <laughs> Yep. Okay. So moving along. So we have that. This this takes on with the with the piano and and when the the bass starts bouncing around, it's um it's a definitely a very sort of lively and very Jewish theme sa sounding melody. Um. So, uh, and that then broadens out here in this fortissimo outburst. Yeah. This is a co uh, Jonan's reaction. <sighs> I mean, in in it's huge, yeah. In, in his mind, he, you know, I mean, Leia is his, but in reality, it's not true, and he dies. He's very, he's yeah. very upset. Yeah. And, yeah, and he dies from heartbreak. Yeah, and then this sounds like here, all of a sudden, there's a step back, and it's very pensive. Dum I mean, here it alternates, the mood alternates between um, the ferocious passion and introspection. Yes. And this is just and, two moods, yeah. Yeah, so so we also then have... Um, so and this, this is where Jonan dies. Right what, here, this forte. Yes. Yeah, this well, is... <laughs> You know, it's kind of yeah. He, uh, <laughs> it's very, uh, very very detailed, but in reality, I mean, music flows. And yes, exactly. Music does not stop. Uh, the uh, flow of music does I not love, stop. I love your writing. The melodies are so beautiful here, um, and you have various. You have a lot of wonderful counterpoint. You have counter melodies in the piano right hand with you know against the violin and with the cello and and it all just works and weaves together so beautifully and then we see here he's you bring back the this little chromaticism uh which is just sort of like a little bit of a 
blurry, you know, tone, like a sound um, effect in the piano as we're winding down this section. And it, it's, it's just very um, mystical, ethereal, and, um, and a little bit, um, I, there, there is that tinge of, of a little uncertainty, a um, little bit of uh, well, sadness and melancholy. Um, but at a certain point in the piece, we do, that changes. Um, so, so we still have this same theme. Da -dum, ba -da 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 -da. And uh, this continues with a lot of question and answer in the three uh, instruments. Yeah. Now we have no, yeah. section F, the fugue. No. No, we have we have a klezmer fugue, and I'm so happy that I could write a klezmer fugue. I'm <laughs> fascinated with uh, Maria de Buenos Aires and Piazzolla. I mean, there's a fugue in Maria de Buenos Aires. Uh huh. Tango fugue, and I was thinking, can I write a klezmer fugue? So <laughs> I was so delighted that I could uh, write my klezmer fugue. So yeah. this uh, polyphonic composition be, uh, comments on how everything is intertangled in this world the yes promise made in the past there's a broken promise and everything actually connects really well in, yeah. in this mystery so this is a fugue where all all the voices are three voices yeah well, the piano then finally comes in yeah um, and and double. this is how everything is connected together so it's comments on the complexity yeah uh, and you know when i was first looking at the score this seemed to me very reminiscent of Shostakovich's second trio, the E minor trio. I think sure, it's sure. That's my, that's my uh, bringing in Moscow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, and, flattering. And it's, it's flattering to be compared with Shostakovich, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it, it definitely has that kind of textural sonority yeah. in the piano part. It, and um, uh, But of course, it, it you know, it's uniquely you, Ilya. There's, you know, I, you can. I could not point to any particular aspect of your music that is derivative, per se, of any other composer. It's just sort of maybe a little reminiscent of you know the compositional style. But your your style is also uniquely your own, which I love. Thank you. Um, thank you. But just so for so for listeners who may not you know be able to envision what the score sounds like from looking at it, um, it, it it has a similar texture, I guess. I you know as Shostakovich, and um, I believe you know this this whole piece as I um, scrolling through it for people to see, um, this whole work should just really become a part of the piano trio canon. It's 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 just wonderful. Um, so this fugue. Uh, Constantly has, here's the theme in the piano, it, it's alternating, you know, it's, it runs itself through in different keys and it keeps modulating and going through the, each instrument. And, um, and then we get to uh, like a, a slowdown of it or augmentation. Uh, of it. You combine da -dum, ba -dum, that interval of yeah. a fourth is also in common. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's in the entire piece. Yeah, yeah. So, so everything is so integrated and connected. Sure. Um, so the piece is all like, feels like it's all in one movement with different sections. Yeah. Um, even if you conceived it, of it as separate movements per se, um, I can't imagine, it's not like a Beethoven trio where you can play one movement. You have to play yeah, the I mean, Yeah, you can't. Yeah. You can't just get up and, you know, start this piece and have it make sense, you know, just start it in the middle of somewhere, you know? Yeah. Um, so I will. I would like to show our listening um, audience, viewing audience, uh, the next section. Um, so we, we kind of are winding down and the texture thins out first to the two voices and then just little piano here. And we get to the insistent section. Now, is this the part that correlates with the dance of the poor? Yes, the the, the dance of the poor and when Leia goes to the cemetery to invite her dead mother. Uh, and this is where the book enters the body of Leia. And at the end, she dies and in the last movement, they unite. Yeah, it's kind of like, um, uh, 
what what is that um, that dance now? Dance macabre. I mean, it kind yeah. of it builds up uh, of Saint Saint. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. Mm -hmm. It kind of starts out. Um, you know, it, it has this minor tonality, but it's so lively. So you don't. It, it's kind of twinged with. Um, you know, festivity at the same time, a little bit of darkness. I mean, wedding supposed to be a happy occasion, but not in this case for Leia. <laughs> yeah, she's still mourning her beloved who's passed. So, yeah. um, and I don't know, are we supposed to know that she's mourning? Or like, are we, we, you know, I, I'm, or we don't I, find out till the end until she just dies? And it, it's, it's, I, I did not mean that this piece would be exactly following yeah uh the the text or the plot or the synopsis you know in music mm -hmm. music just flows it takes you on a journey yeah and that's what i felt you know you, you take an inspiration from the piece and after you listen what the music is telling you yeah, I just I, I love this this particular theme, you know, da 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 da. You know, it's it's just it's so jaunty, and you know, surprisingly, the piano just has the accompaniment, but boy, the piano part is so essential to providing like the underpinning of of the character, you know, uh, of this whole piece when. Uh, this part I happen to love right here um, in measure 178 when it starts getting faster and we're building up the tempo. It's it's so exciting and I, I really can't wait till everybody gets to hear this live. And to me, when we get to the, this section J, it's... Um, uh, here it's, you know, you, you, you throw away some of the, you know, the dissonances that we've heard in the slower sections. And um, this is where uh, we find this very accessible kind of, I think it's very declamatory, dum, bum, da, 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 and very klezmer-like here. Yeah, yeah. Very, very dance-like. That was a klezmer band at the wedding, yeah, definitely. Yeah, um, I love it. This section um, right here, where the piano gets the melody really low. Um, but I will tell everybody, uh, here's the, the hard section. These, these notes are going so fast, these chords. Um, uh, it, it's, it's a challenge to play this piece. Uh, just even if it's, uh, you know, certain segments that are difficult, um, they're, they're definitely a challenge for any pianist. Um, and for the string players as well. I mean, just playing harmonics and, and, and getting, you know, this piece goes very fast. I think, what is the, the tempo we... 140. Yeah, 100. Oh, no, this one is 160. 160, yeah. Yeah, and we, we can play it at 160. So it's, it, it, it looks deceptively easy because it's all eighth notes, but it's very quick. Um, and I love this part. For me, when we get to the section K here, um, the violin has in augmentation this melody soaring above, and the piano's just playing, you know, pure accompaniment. Here's where the pianist gets to take it easy. Um, you know, it's it's not terribly difficult, although there's some some certainly some nice leaps and stuff in the left hand, but nothing nothing extraordinarily difficult. Um, but here is what I love: is this very long uh, augmented melody in the violin against the da dum ba ba dum ba ba dum ba ba dum ba bum ba ba bum. Yeah, I like contrapoint, and I try to use contrapoint. Oh, it's as just as possible. It's really really great, and especially um what i i also like um you know that they're to going along and then you give the piano takes over a little bit in in this measure in 20 225 and um and at this point you take those eighth notes and the piano and cello kind of have this really cool um, transitional effect with the right. staccato, right. and and that sets up that completely sets up the um, the underlying pulse in the left hand of the piano uh, for the next section. 
So, um, dum, bum, bum, ba, da, dum, ba, da, dum, ba, dum. and so now that the piano gets more of the theme and is also giving uh, a substantial part of like a new rhythmic feel. And um, it, it's to me that the, the writing and this, you know, the way that this whole thing flows from one section to the other, it's, it's just totally masterful, Ilya. Um, I, I love here in the L section, the longing section, um, you bring in a new melody against um, the da 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 in the cello. Right. And you have, so you have three things going on. You have the violin melody, you have the, the left hand, the cello, and then you also give the piano a little something melodic. Dum, ba, da, da. You know, so it's it's all it's taking over like a, a little bit more of the augmented um, right. yeah. the augmentation yeah. uh, in the right hand, keeping that uh, like little staccato rhythm a little bit longer, and then gradually slowing it down to quarter notes, and then basically. Yeah, th this is uh, Susan, this is one of the challenges of writing fast music. I mean, fast music is very easy to start, but how do you end? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Fast, 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 I mean, you, you can end with a bang. I mean, the hard ending. But if you want to transition, you need to somehow to slow down the effect. Yeah, and this is very challenging. And it's yeah, and it and it's very well written into the music, um, harmonically as well. Um, and then this next section, mysterioso section, uh, has um, fiendishly difficult passage, uh, you know, because of how just it, it's not very fast, so it's actually not difficult at this point, but it's just atmospheric, right? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so. So I just start out by setting that atmosphere and mm -hmm. uh, and the violins and the cello come in con sordino. Would you like to tell our audience what that means? Oh, oh it's, a, it's a, with a mute. With a yeah. mute when they play uh, a place, uh, piece on the bridge and bridge does not vibrate that much. Mm -hmm. and, and the piano is written inside the space delineated by violin and cello. And I was particularly happy finding this effect because it, it, again it's it's a, it's a question of space you have something on the bottom you have something on top and you have a wash of sound and effect in the middle in, in the middle yeah but i didn't realize how difficult <laughs> to well, put together <laughs> you know what you know what it, it the difficulty lies is in if the violin and cello don't listen to yeah. the um, all of these notes, and if they don't know them really well, they sometimes can have a tendency to move ahead faster. And I'm left, oh my God, you know, like I got to hurry up or I got to slow down or, I, you know, so I'm, I'm doing it very evenly and, and not at all, it's not that fast. Um, mm -hmm. Where it gets to be a little bit more difficult and, you know, you can definitely split it between the hands as you see right. fit. And then of course you put it in both hands um, makes it a little bit more difficult. Um, but where it really gets difficult is after um, this whole section, we get to, um, oh, I'm scrolling, trying to look for it now. Where is it? Coming, it's coming. Uh, coming, coming. Um, here, this, this is a really cool thing because the left hand is still steady notes, but their half is, their half is fast. And um, and so we have the triplet quarter notes aligning with the cello and violin on the first part of the beat, but it never quite aligns with the left hand. So my left hand has to be like totally independent, keep that nice steady. Keeps, um, keeps the timing, keeps the timing. Yeah, left hand exactly. Timing. Um, so so this is a very um, beautiful effect, I think, here. I, um, I, I just... I, I love the the melodic your use of melody in this piece is really extraordinary, and I think that uh, people will really love the way Alex uh, Kaufman and um, Martin Benman, your wife, how they play this piece um, in our rehearsals. There's there's just so much emotion, you know, um, and it's ju it's just beautiful. The uh, here 
we have discovered that this tempo at 140 becomes almost impossible. Yeah, we need to bring it down. But, but so we've, we've, we've decided to make this more of like an augmentation of the right. theme in the cello. And then um, we're kind of back up to our tempo right. here. Mm -hmm. And um, you, you still hear a little bit of the theme here in the left hand and it's just very jaunty. I mean, it's very exciting, lots of big chords, octaves and whatnot. So um, I think that the audience will absolutely love it. Um, this is one of my favorite places here when they're playing Sultasto and I play da 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 um, I love that melody. It's just so catchy. And then we get back to this, a return of this, um, uh, it, the whole thing just works together so well. Um, anyway, what else happened? What's happening here now uh, in the trio? We get back to the Mysterioso. From 32 on, we're sort of winding down. Yes, and, and after there is a conclusion because yeah i felt that at this point there are some so much emotions in the piece that it needs to kind of have an arch to wind down there's almost here there's something about this line that's in the cello and then in the um in the violin and then you know it's canonical yeah. uh, it, it, when I'm listening to this and with the harmony underneath it, it's definitely, there's a, there's a definite pain, a sorrowfulness yeah, yeah. here. And this sort of sense of having come through uh, quite a journey. Yes. Is, would you say this is after the exorcism? Or, yeah. And this is, is this after the wedding, of course? And yeah, so, I mean, this is where uh, Chonin and Leia unite. Yeah. So it, 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 it's kind of, I would say, kind of feeling like a little haunting and um, just a really haunting melody and very poignant feeling to it. It's really almost impossible to describe this music, which is why I really hope that people will tune in. You can come, if you live in the Chicago area, you can come to Sheridan Music Studio and hear us perform this live next Sunday. Um, so just a little bit more viewing, um, the whole piece winds down um, at, uh, in the, th this next, this section here, you know what this reminds me of in the, um, when the piano's playing those high notes, it reminds me of your elegy, when you have the time, the ticking with the, the violin playing cold leno right. and keeping time because it's just right. like, you know, and you, you really have a, a it's, it's very effective. I mean, the, here, of course, the cello is really has the principal voice yeah. and is um, it's absolutely, absolutely beautiful. Did you write this um, with, with Martine in mind when you were writing it? Well, probably unconsciously, everything I write for cello is my, my, I hear so much cello also, every day. Yeah. Also for your son, Sasha, who's a cellist. Right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so um, I, I imagine that um, this trio will get plenty of performances uh, before long. And uh, I especially love the way you bring it all back together as uh, in the end with the piano doing these little um, chromatic um, little descending yes flashes yeah i mean it returns to this space yeah, yeah. and and it, it and it just sort of all of a sudden one feels like you've gone through this whole arc and you've yeah. just come back you've come around a full circle in this piece um which is you know what makes a great work of art of music is when you after you experience it you have a sense of of transformation and aha oh wow you know like even if we didn't tell anybody what this piece was about even without the programmatic underpinnings of what inspired you um i think that just 
as pure absolute music, the listener will really know what this is about just from listening. Um, but of course, the understanding deepens when you know you and I um, discuss it. Um, right. can, you, can you talk a little bit, Ilya, about your compositional process? How how do you compose when you are you at the piano? Do you mostly compose with a keyboard at a computer, or do you do sketches like Beethoven? Or how did this happen for you? Well, well, I, I can say uh, you know it took me what uh, then seventeen years thinking about well, no, maybe sixteen years. It was material was kind of percolating in my unconscious and probably about four weeks to write. Okay. Wow. And, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, composers, they always working I and mean, the mind never shuts down. And um, well, it's, you know, I, I guess intuitively, I del try to delay to the very last possible moment to start really working on a piece because I know when I start working, the uh, outside world will cease to exist because every moment I will be um, working on, on the piece. And, uh, you know, I, I visited uh, Legar's house uh, in Austria and he, when he would were working on the operetta, he would kick out every one of the house. So he didn't want any distractions and, so it's, and, and, and that's 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 a process and it's kind of very unsettling because you hear music it's constantly working in your head from the first note to the last and sometimes you okay i need to change this because i mean it's exhausting I, I, it's an obsessive compulsive like when you get into the mode of yeah. composing, then it's like you you just are completely uh, consumed with this process. Absolutely, absolutely, yes. You know, it reminds me when my son Scott, Scott Green, who's also known as Megaphonics, is a composer and uh, mostly working in the electronic music field. Um, but when he was just 13, uh, he, grad he just graduated eighth grade. So it was just as he was entering ninth grade and school was over and he disappeared into his room at his computer. And a week later he came out and said, mom, I wrote a symphony. Yeah. That's what it took. Like it was a symphony. It was called the hybrid symphony. Yeah. Um, and it was a six or seven minute piece, three movements. And, I, I never, I'll never forget that his first piece actually kind of put him that first piece that he wrote, he had written other things, um, small things, but that was like his first piece that kind of put him on the map because it won him a prize. It won him first prize at the Illinois Music Educators Association conference. Right. So he became the first prize winner in the whole state when he was just uh, 13 years old for this one composition. And, you know, it's funny because you at that point, well, I didn't know if I had a composer on my hands for a son or not. Um, but I, I always tell people when I was a young girl, pianist, studying, you know, young child, I had written in my diary or for some kind of writing assignment that I want to be a, a pianist and a composer. And my compositional dreams never took hold. Uh, it was something I loved when I was really young. Um, and just the thought of being a composer. Uh, I mean, I was just so enamored with all things music when I was uh, a child. Um, and it, then I, I think I became obsessive compulsive just about interpretation and being a concert pianist. Um, so it was for me, it was... Uh, it was wonderful when we discovered that or I was going to have a son who's a composer um, because to me um, the true genius uh, lies in the creation of original work. And um, I, not that being an interpreter and bringing the music to life isn't, doesn't require its own, you know, special skills and qualities, but um, 
you know, my hat's off to you, Ilya, for being, you know, an absolutely astonishing composer. Just, I just look forward to um, our continued collaboration. And I'm so very honored um, about uh, doing the premiere of this work. And I'm excited that um, next season, I'll be playing some of your other pieces in some public concerts that has not been announced yet. So I'm not at liberty to announce that. Um, but we will, I am at liberty to say we will be doing this ghost themed concert on October 31st um, in person, live at, hopefully, I mean, we're assuming everything yeah. stays open um, at the Northbrook Public Library. So, um, but if you want to hear it premiered, this will be the world premiere and Chicago premiere. It's going to be this coming Sunday, a week from today at Sheridan Music Studio. And we have a limited number of in-person seats. It's indoors. And I would like everybody to know that we have UV light air purification. We do require everyone to be vaccinated to come into the studio. Um, and, uh, we are going to limit the seating in the studio. So if you want to attend a live concert um, featuring works by Beethoven and Ilya Levinson, you've got to go to in.live and you've got to purchase the ticket in advance. So we know how many seats, how, what to expect. And um, we are really excited about getting back to normal and getting back to live concerts and live audiences because the music is always live for like you and me, right, Ilya? Like we're yeah. rehearsing it, we're in person, we, we, yeah. we're, we're doing it and we are getting this live effect, but it's the audience that really makes, gives the whole performance additional meaning that we as performers really can't live without. So um, the audience is a very, very critical component of any live performance. Absolutely. And um, we value our audience both in person and virtual. And the one great thing that this pandemic has taught us is that music will continue to live. It will live um, even in the absence of a, a, the concert venues being open, it can live virtually. And, and this is great because it actually has expanded our reach. And this means that not only are we limited to the in-person, in-studio audience or in the venue audience, um, but we can have an expanded reach to our virtual audience, um, all the virtual people around the world. So um, that's why it, this is like this pandemic, there is a silver lining in what has been a horrific year for all of us, for so many to have gone through um, a worldwide catastrophic event such as a pandemic like this. Um, I think that the very fact, Ilya, that you have come out of this pandemic with a whole brand new work to share. Right. Right. It's, it's just really, it's a testament. It's a testament to you, to me, to all, all the musicians, all of us who are still in this and really doing what we love um, and, and keeping the music alive through this time. Um, this is a testament to our passion, our dedication, and when the audience shows up to watch us and hear our our efforts and our music making, um, that's the icing on the cake. That's what you know. What what more could we ask for? So, for those of you watching, um, we're gonna. I think as we have we talked enough about it. I think we should. The less said now, the better. We should stop while we're ahead yeah. and just hopefully we've enticed people to come. And um, I'm gonna stop sharing this so we can see the two of us a little bit in person. Yeah, hopefully you and I, Ilya, have enticed people to come and hear this um, really um, incredible, beautiful piece. Um, it's, it, you know what, it just, it has something for everybody in it. I mean, it, it just tells a whole story and I'm so excited about it. Um, okay, Ilya, thank you so much. Um, 
you're always welcome to be our guest um, on Steinway Sundays. Um, and also we um, are eagerly awaiting for your new um, Orpheum Budapest, wait, say it again. New Budapest or Orpheum Society, your ensemble. We would love you to be um, come perform at our studio. So yeah. we've got to set a date for that. Yeah, um, we start rehearsing again. Everyone is ready. Yeah, when everyone's gotten their vaccinations yeah. and everyone's yeah. ready to, to yeah. get back in person, um, we want you to be amongst the first to be streamed Thank and you. performing at our studio. Mm -hmm. So um, we have that to look forward to. And um, thank you so much, Ilya. Your friendship and your artistry um, astounds me and gives me so much um, just great pleasure and love, you know, and um, I can't thank you enough. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susan. My pleasure. Okay. Goodbye, everyone. So make sure you come and hear it next Sunday. June 13th, 2 p.m. Go to in.live. There'll be more posts about it on social media. Thank you and goodbye. Have a great afternoon or evening, everyone. Bye-bye.